Good morning. Welcome to worship with St. Augustine First UMC. I'm your pastor, Pastor Tim Turner. Let's praise God together. I wonder so aimless life filled with sin. I wouldn't let my dear Savior end. giving us hope beyond the present moment. My God, even when we look back, we know you've been faithful, especially when we look back. We know you've been faithful. And it's because of your faithfulness that we can sing in this present moment with confidence. You are guiding the future. So we trust you. We worship you. We praise you, Lord. give you thanks this morning. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. This morning, we continue the sermon series on the hospitality called Open House. We continue by looking at a familiar passage from Luke chapter 10. I'm going to read Luke chapter 10, where we're at this morning. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Hear the word of God. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now he said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And the lawyer answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to the lawyer, You've given the right answer. 
do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back I will repay you whatever you may spend. Which of these three do you think, Jesus asked, was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. I love that Jesus answers the question with a question. <laughs> Actually, even more, I love that Jesus answers the lawyer's question with a story. Jesus, in the story, takes us to a place we all know deep down. We've all been there once before. In fact, we know the place quite well, even though we often forget. He takes us down a journey of an unfamiliar road, a dangerous road, a, a road descending into treacherous desert hills there in Israel. In fact, it's the road between Jerusalem and Jericho. And they say that on that road, between Jerusalem and Jericho, the elevation, it drops 3,300 feet in just the matter of, of 17 miles. The hills and, and caves down that treacherous road, they offer easy hideouts for, for bandits. And for a, a lone traveler, these aren't the safest parts of Israel. And I picture in my mind one of those western film scenes where the hero goes searching in the hill country for the notorious outlaw and his crew of bandit thugs. And everything gets really quiet, really still. The sheriff may even dismount from his horse and start walking real slow, real stealth. You know, we know what comes next. Ambush. Except when Jesus tells the story, we don't get to see things from the eyes of a gun-loaded sharpshooter. Instead, we see the dangerous scene unfold through the eyes of a certain man. Jesus, in fact, leaves the man unnamed. He's a, a mystery figure. I mean, we assume the, the man came from Israel. We assume he was a, a Jew, but, but he could be anyone, really. I mean, he could have been rich, poor, Jew, Gentile, tall, short, red, yellow, black, white. I mean, we know next to nothing about this random man Jesus tells us about in the story. All we really know is, is Jesus takes us down that Jericho Valley through the eyes of this certain man. And down in that dark, quiet, ominous valley. We creep along with extra eyes because we know what comes next. We've lived the same story, actually. Ambush. The man hits rock bottom, but that's when the real story Jesus is telling actually begins. Look with me again at verse 30 of this Luke chapter 10 passage. Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that same road. Here we are, half dead, 
grabbing hold of whatever life we can find. Do you see yourself as the man in the ditch? We're grabbing hold of whatever life we can find. And Jesus speaks a word of hope. He says, now, by chance, all right, by chance. I mean, can't you see who's coming down the valley? That's That's got to be a priest. Surely that's a, a priest. I mean, he's got those long ornamental robes, the sash around his neck. It, it clearly gives him away. I mean, here we are in the ditch. We might be gasping for air wounded in the ditch. But he'll surely stop to save us. I mean, he's a priest. Except... That's not how the story goes. By chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. We know the story. Now, according to Jewish law, if a priest saw a dead corpse while on a journey, the priest was bound by religious duty to stop and bury the body. But if he sees signs of life, yeah, it's a little bending of the rules, but there's no need to stop. In other words, the scene plays out this way. It's a different way of seeing the same scene that Jesus tells, but he wasn't religiously bound to stop. The priest comes walking over the hill. He sees the man in the ditch, the man beaten down, and left for dead. I imagine the priest thinks about that law, thinks, oh, there's a, a dead body I need to bury, but then, help. Ah, whew, he's only half dead. The priest, in other words, would have treated a dead corpse better than he treated our beaten down man. And from the eyes of that, that helpless man, we can almost feel the weight of utter shock as the priest keeps walking. And out of his lowest place, even the pastor walks right by. But Jesus keeps going with the story, doesn't he? Because another traveler comes walking down the hill. I mean, this one will surely stop. Clearly, that's a Levite. They live for perfecting holiness, these people of the Jewish law. I mean, purity is their constant pursuit. Beyond a doubt, that Levite is surely going to stop to pick us up. But we know what Jesus said in verse 32. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. It seems the Levite sees himself as, as too pure for a half-dead man. He's got better things to care for, after all. And from the eyes of our unnamed, beaten-down man, at this point, the whole scene couldn't look more grim. Of course, we know what comes next. We've already read it, and, and we've read this story many times already in our lives. And yet, as Jesus stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with a self-justifying lawyer, as Jesus told this story, this familiar story to us of the beaten-down man, the crowd gathered around. Jesus didn't know what came next. In fact, they, they couldn't possibly know what Jesus would have said next because to a Jew, Samaritans were unclean people. To a Jew, Samaritans had mixed with outcast Assyrians and polluted Israel, Israel's purity. I mean, the hatred between these two groups, it went so deep that a Jew in Jesus' day would add 20 miles to a walking tour just to keep from going through Samaria. And as Jesus has us here on the edge of our seat, waiting to hear what might come next in the story, waiting to hear the, the fate of our beaten down man, and I can almost hear the crowd gathered around the lawyer and Jesus audibly gasp as the lone Samaritan crosses over the top of the hill. Verse 33. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. When he saw him, he was moved with pity. 
He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on him. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, that's two days' worth of wages, and he gave him to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. You know, from my own eyes, I wonder about the story behind the story of this Samaritan. About this Samaritan, Jesus makes this moving phrase. He says, when he saw the man, he was moved with pity. And I wonder about the Samaritan. Why? What moved this man with pity? I mean, was it... Was it just sheer human dignity that the priest and Levite lacked? Was he, was he basically just a better person than the priest and the Levite? I mean, for the, the Samaritan, stopping, after all, could be a trap. I mean, that beaten down man, this was common in that day, that beaten down man could have just been a fake decoy set up for an ambush. But the Samaritan pays no attention to all those risks. And I wonder... Why? And yet even more, the Samaritan clearly goes above and beyond. I mean, he covers the full cost of this stranger's recovery. And he even promises to go the extra mile if the bill gets too high. Why? And Jesus puts the question back to the self-righteous lawyer. Which of these three do you think? was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber. And the lawyer almost hesitates to answer. I mean, he doesn't say Samaritan. He says instead this, the one who showed him mercy. But we all know the truth. It was the Samaritan. And the lawyer can't answer why either. And yet I have a a bit of a theory of why the Samaritan felt love and mercy when the priest and Levite blew right past. It's a theory that I think Jesus leaned heavily into right here. A theory about the story behind the story. You know, most of Israel would have looked down on that Samaritan in Jesus' parable. And the Samaritans, they, they, they would have known full well what it feels like to sit on the side of the road and be overlooked. And when he comes to the beaten down man, I bet the Samaritan saw himself in all that struggle. But the Levite, the Levite seems to see himself somewhere else. And the priest, but the priest brushes it all off and, and walks right past like it has nothing to do with him. You know, in the Old Testament, God gives a word so completely fitting to this Good Samaritan parable that as I was writing the sermon, I just had to connect to the two ideas. It's simple. God tells the people of God at at nearly every major junction of faith. He says, love the outcast, care for the stranger, embrace the wounded. And then at nearly every major junction of faith, God gives this reason. Because you were once the outcast yourself. You were once wounded, beaten down, and the stranger. You were once held captive in Egypt. But by God's grace... By God's grace, the Red Sea split wide open when all hope felt lost. Never forget, God says. By God's grace, the manna came from thin air. God lifting us up, meeting our needs, giving us strength. When we had all but given up, can anybody say amen on this this recording? Never, Never forget, God says. Never forget where we came from. Never forget the grace of God. At nearly every major junction of faith, God reminds the people that amazing grace is what 
gave us sight when we were blind in the first place. It was grace that gave us hope when we lost our way. Never forget, God says. Never forget the hand of God that has brought us safe thus far. It's easy to forget, though. I think it's easy to, to like the priest, like the Levite, like the lawyer. It's easy to think that, that we stand on the passing side of the road because of our own hard work, our own merit. It's easy to forget. To forget that without God, we have no hope. Without God, we have no peace. It's It's easy to see ourselves as the one passing by on the road. We so quickly forget that it wasn't all that long ago when we sat there on the side of the road, wounded in the ditch. And God gives the people this word. Love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I'm reminded of a song we sing over and over and over again. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. I was blind, but now I see. And that's the beauty of gospel hospitality, isn't it? We love because God first loved us. The moment we measure out who is and is not worthy, the moment we count up our good deeds, that's usually when we are the ones passing by on the other side of the road. But when we live each day mindful of God's grace, when we live each day aware of who got us, truly here. When we remember God's grace at every step of the way. We can't help but love as God loves. And so now we thank God for pulling us up from that miry clay. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to sing one more song a familiar song done in a, a new way. You've heard it before though. Amazing Grace. Let's sing this together. Amazing Grace How sweet the sound That sin a wretch like me. I once was lost, now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. My chains are gone. i
sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here will be forever mine. Will be forever mine. You are forever. pray that this week we might remember God's grace every day, every moment. That God's grace might remind us of, of the love that first lifted us. Not so that we just sit and relish in, in God's love as if that's what it's all about. But so that we become that love embodied whatever creative ways God is calling us to embody that love this week. May you go in God's peace, God's love, God's grace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.